Hi there guys and welcome to today's Captain's Blog. We are here on the bench with Mr. Kidwell behind the camera. And I have something that I've wanted to autopsy for years. And I finally get to. And we're, we're going we're gonna to do our first little bit of oscilloscope stuff today too. This is a Penny and Giles fader of which I have several. Now these are... Uh, are ridiculously expensive little things. You can buy a whole mixing console for the price of the four faders I have in front of me. In fact, round numbers, the four faders I have in front of me are about a thousand dollars for the set sitting here. Um, some of these are for the wheat stone, some of these are just for whatever. This one was removed from VT8 in 1997. It's got pour off attenuation. So, yeah. And we've got this one here. Now what a fader does is basically, it's a potentiometer, but it's a, a very high precision potentiometer. And how that works is really cool. And I wanted to take a minute and explore one of these because I get to talk about why when you turn the volume knob on your dingus, it goes and it gets crackly and nasty. And I'm gonna tell you how to fix that. So let's take a look in here. Now what this is, is normally you would only see this sticking out of the top of the mixing console. You just have a slit and you'd see the little T-bar move back and forth. Now I'm going to show you what this does. As I move this, as this is all the way down, we can see the voltage on the oscilloscope is all the way down. That's our, our yellow bar down there at the bottom. So the first thing is, and that's that's off off. We're absolutely 100% off. So I move it just a little bit and you can see that jumps up very quickly at first. That brings us up out of the bottom below the noise floor. So we come up and now from here up, as I move this nice and even, you can see that goes up logarithmically. So this is a logarithmic taper potentiometer. So we move, we come down a whole lot at first, shoom, and then really slowly. And then we just crash off at the bottom. Now, before we crash off, we hold in a very small area for a long way. Now those of you who aren't broadcast or audio engineers, comment in and, and, and see if you can guess why that is. Why would we want, this is a, an audio taper fader, a logarithmic audio taper fader. Why would it matter that our fader affect the voltage like that? Because that's really not what you'd expect. You'd expect it to be like a nice even rise all the way from the bottom to the top, and it's not. It's something totally different. Now why would we do that? for audio. This is a really cool thing to explore because it's very counterintuitive. But I'll give you a hint. Look at the decibel scale and how it works. Because the decibel scale is evil and a horrible bit of math, but it's true. And it's one of those things where you get into things in mathematics and physics that are very counterintuitive. It's not what you would think it is, but that's just how it be. So we're going to open this up and take a look inside because it's an equipment autopsy and what we do is destroy and dismantle really expensive equipment. So I'm going to pop this open so that you guys can see inside it. And to all the people doubting that I'm actually doing this to a working Penny and Giles fader, you can see it's hooked up to the oscilloscope and it says right there. And that's inside. And isn't that amazing? This is not what you're going to find if you take apart your dumpster diving Fisher stereo. You're, you're not going to find faders that look this good. This is, this is art. This is amazing. So what we see is there's a printed circuit board down in the bottom, and there's a pair of rails, and then there's this armature that slides back and forth on them. And we can see the electrical connections coming down into the side. So let's go another layer in, because that's where we start to get to really see how this works. So I'm going to pop these out. I'm going to run our fader right up to the end and then bend these back so we can break this end free. There we go. So I can take the rails are just, you know, nice, smooth, polished steel rails. Here's our armature. And you can see on the bottom of the armature, there's four little wipers. There's actually two sets of two. These are 
electrically joined here and these are electrically joined here. Now here's the part you probably can't see and this is where I really wish we had a microscope to show you this, but look closely. If I wipe across one of these, that's actually several little tiny hair thin wipers. Isn't that cool? There's a whole bunch of them there. And the reason for that is you want to have independent suspension. And it helps keep things clean. So when we get down into here, there's a nice rainbow effect off of the reflected light. Cool. That's not a rainbow. You know oil, what that is? Oil film? No, pan up. You know? Oh, it's the reflection of the sign. <laughs> I was getting that with other stuff. It took me oh, a minute to figure it, it out. Yeah, I got yeah. green and red. Yep. All red, right returning. All right, yeah. so down in here, what we have happening is this circuit board is actually passive resistors. And you can even see markings here 5, 10, 15, 20, 30. 40, 50, 60, and then dot, dot. And then we've got 70 down here on the inside. Remember, it's a logarithmic. Yep. So what's happening here is this is a resistive element. And when we start all the way down here is dead. And we actually have less and less resistance the further up we go until we have basically no resistance at the top. And the armature, now if I can line this up, this will actually work. If I put the armature in here. You're upside down. No, I'm not. I got my the, the T goes off the other side. Oh, yeah, okay. So if I line this up in here, now this is really hard without the things, but you can see, if I just track this down, if you look at the oscilloscope, you can see it does the same job. But if I just take, if I take this up and then lift it off, it drops again getting some really nice noise there. Yeah. But if I just touch it on there, it comes back. Because what this is doing, you can see we've got our bars coming down. And these line up to touching the outside bars. These tracks, these bars, are carbon. And probably a bunch of other fun sciencey things, but it's a printed circuit where the top is exposed. It's, it's not, there's no conformal coating on there. There's no insulation. And when these bridges bridge out these two connections here and these two connections here, because this is, let's say the left channel and this is the right. I don't know which is which on here, but we'll just say this is the left channel here and this is the right. Right there, we're wired. So okay. we're using this out. Is red right? Uh, no, that's power. Oh, okay. Um, the other four unused pads yeah. would be the other channel. This is just a mono fader. This is just mono? Yeah. So... The unused, you can see the unused pads right there go to the right set of bars. So those go here. So we're just using this side. You're just using And they the use the same circuit board for stereo and mono because... Cheaper that yeah, way. Yeah, cheaper to manufacture it. Okay. So we're only using these two. Yeah. So that means if I were to... I'm. I might be able to get lucky and do this, but I'm going to touch it with the screwdriver. Yep, you can kind of get it. There. And if I go up here, it's higher. There we go. Oh, you're scratching that up. Something oh yeah, I'm I'm destroying that for sure. But that's where you get your crackles. Yeah. So that's how a fader works. These little contacts just rub against this with the lightest of pressure. And depending on where these are, depends on the electricity has to go all the way up, jump across and come all the way back. And that controls the resistance. And we're also bringing to play these elements over here, which are very precision routed and known resistances 
to control exactly what our resistance is and, and thusly what our attenuation is of the signal, depending on where we are in here. So because we know that, because we, we now know that there's a coating on here and there's wipers that ride along it, here's things that can go wrong. One, these can wear away, but that doesn't happen very often. Two, these can wear away, and that happens all the time. Or, some kind of contaminant, dust, schmutz, whatever, gets on here and gets in between this and these. A very common contaminant here is some manner of soda pop or carbonated adult beverages. The number of people who have dumped large amounts of beer into a recording console kills my soul. But this happens. And when you do that, you just added your, you know, own recreational conformal coating on this and they gum up and they won't work anymore. And that's why. Now you can open them up like this and you can clean these. There's, there's any number of ways you could do that and probably bring it back. Um, if the contamination in here is where these are oxidized or this has some kind of oxide coating or dust or schmoo or what, the absolute end all be all best product for cleaning old crackly faders. If you have, and I don't care if this is your grandma's stereo or a hundred thousand dollar console, if you have faders that, okay, doesn't really happen with digital faders, this is more of an analog problem, but if you have analog faders like these, where they make a substance called deoxit, comes in a little red bottle. If you own a mixing console, you should own a bottle of this. It's not expensive, but it's basically the audio engineer's WD-40. Anything you have that and that's a thing, deoxid, it works. The shit is awesome and I love it and I've used it for a long time. I have a bottle of it. To, I probably have five bottles of it around your some damn place, but I'm still getting moved into the new shop, so I, I don't have it dug out to show you. But that's, that's how you fix it, deoxid. And they're not paying me to say that. I actually do use it and believe in the product. It's good stuff. But that's, that's our basics of how a fader works. And let's see if I got a steady enough hand to do this. Can I make it up? It's, this is like audio engineer version of playing operation. Can I get all the way from one end of the fader to the other? Yeah. Yeah, but if you fall off the track, it doesn't work. Quite cool. right. That's so cool. It's so smooth. It's just, it's an object to art. And it's simple stuff like this. It just blows my mind. Think of the work that went into that. This is, this is generations of knowledge and effort and, and work that went into making this. So let's cut it apart. Yeah, yeah I'm right in there. Oh! No, I fucked it. Ceramic board. Yeah, that's uh, that's delicate. See, I thought it was just held in by the little snaps, and I'd be able to pop it right out. I think it's, uh, I think no. it's glued in there. This is quality British manufacturing. And as a person who has a non-trivial amount of experience with Lucas Electrical work, I I may have some opinions about the quality of British skills and anything to do with wires. Um, but Penny something and Giles... Lucas, isn't there something about letting the smoke out of Lucas equipment? They Well, it's not equipment, it's cars. Cars. They do cars. Yeah. And uh, if you ever own an automobile with Lucas, Lucas Electrical, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Just... Yes. I just, remember seeing memes about that like 20 years ago. Yeah. Before the I don't know what day. it's like now because I haven't worked on a car that had Lucas Electric in it in 20 years, but... But it used to be pretty bad. Oh, can I get you out? I don't... I, hmm. Is that a glass board or is it... I don't know. It's a glued board. Yeah, they didn't... They weren't, in, they weren't planning on somebody taking this apart. No, this does... You do not mess with this. This is a sacred holy artifact. Get the, it's blue all the way through. It doesn't feel ceramic. I, 
are we still? I don't think it'll work because I've, I've lost track. You, yeah, you cut the uh, power trace. Yeah, you're not getting any power in. That trace right there is the power trace and it's broke. Or, yeah, uh, that's power. But if I get down here and I start doing things. Maybe. No, not work. But the... Uh, There's no way that works. No. No way that works. Can't can't work. Can't be done. I have some cool noise happening. So yeah, that's the inside of Penny and Giles fader. And the big thing that makes this special is these little squigglies on the side. That's that's where you get into some really cool engineering happening. And the cool thing about my videos is there's somebody who has a lot more free time than I do who's going to measure these out and like Photoshop this and do interesting things and be able to explain things better than I can because the cool thing about my viewers is a lot of them are smarter than I am like I understand the how and the why it works and then there's there's people that get in there and be like actually the composition is this nah, and they know like the the composition of the materials and all. so if you read the comments down below you're probably going to learn more it's like the the addendum to the video. You'll learn more reading the comments than you do from, from me. I'm just an idiot taking things apart, but some of the people who watch this video are pretty damn smart. So thank you guys for hanging out and watching my video. You guys have fun. We'll be back with more next time. Do you want to take another one apart? No. Because <laughs> they're... They're all going to be exactly the same. Yeah, they just are. The other ones just different have, sizes. It'll have the rest of the wires popping. So I know a video we need to make in the future. What's that? How many amps we can pull through one of these. Oh, boy. What happens if we try and dim a 1,000-watt light bulb with this? It just turns into... Yeah. Can we, make, can, we, can we put enough amps through one of these to make the traces glow? For a very short period of time. This could be cool. You guys have fun. We'll see you next time.